Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. On this episode of Jill on Money, why you need to find a little bit of love for the financial system. The financial system is like your blood supply. You don't want to think about it, but you can't survive without it. You only think about it when it's infected. You start to look at the whole financial system as like a bad thing when it's doing so much for you. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. We always like to bring in cool guests. And I'll be honest with you. When I first read about this guy, I immediately pounced and said, Mark, we have to have him. Why? Not because I knew anything about him. I just love the title of his book, How Money Became Dangerous. The inside story of our turbulent relationship with modern finance. The author is Christopher Varelis. He wrote the book with a guy named Dan Stone. But I wanted to interview Varelis. He is a child of Wall Street in the same way that I have. We grew up in this system. And so here is our interview with Christopher Varelis. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. First of all, we start the podcast. Very important question. You ready? Mm -hmm. Best financial or career decision you ever made? Moving to California after the dot-com boom. When everybody was moving east, I moved west because I thought that was when the opportunity was at its height. Oh, my God. What a great trader mentality you have. Oh, yeah. All right. So tell us a little bit about yourself. You are a we, – we were just talking before we went on the air. We were both very old Wall Street Streeters. We, we kind of like the old school Wall Street thing. We do. We do. I was the liberal arts major that somehow ended up on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. How did that happen? Uh, it was thanks to my Greek mother who said, go to experience and don't worry if you fail. When I was looking for that summer job, well, two things happened. One, it was one of the few offers I actually got. Well, there's that. That's, there's that. That's a good one. Well, that's a good one. But it was also the last place everyone saw me going. They said, your personality doesn't fit there. But I always ran to experience. I said, you know what? If it's the last place I should be, it's probably the place I should go. And what was your first job? What did you actually do? Explain that to people. When you get that entry-level job, what does that mean? Well, when you go on the Solomon Brothers trading floor, it really means you grab a chair and a double headset and you go and beg these traders who want nothing to do with you to let you pull up a chair and listen in on their conversations. What about the business drew you in? Well, for trading, it was just the, it seemed like the center of the universe. It was like back in the late 80s, Solomon was the center of the world, the fixed income. And I remember Kaufman, it was like he moved markets. And so I was just like, wow, it just seemed like this is where, you know, the bond markets move, tell you where the world is going. Why not? Why not see it? Why not feel it? Talk about your ascent. What keeps drawing you more and more into this universe? Then I moved into investment banking because my personality didn't fit this, like, make a split-second decision with lots of money based on very little information. I'm much more of a cerebral deal negotiations fit. So I moved into investment banking and M&A. And what drew me in was I'm sitting at the table of the biggest deals in the world. I'm 20-something years old. I know probably less than everyone in the room, but they're asking me what to do. And I thought... Is there any better learning experience than that? And at that time, the idea of investment banking, even, I mean, I know that trading on Wall Street got some notoriety, but investment banking was always the more refined part of the business. And also, to some extent, really adding value, going to a small company or a mid-sized company and saying, how can we help you grow? Right. And so why don't you explain a little bit to some of our listeners, like what was the process of investment banking then, as opposed to what we hear now, which is, oh, okay, some dude who runs a big fund through millions yeah. or billions of dollars into WeWork for no reason. So what's the difference between the WeWork of today and some of those deals in the 80s and 90s? We were really a strategy advisor that was able to implement it. So we would have companies like Northrop or IBM or Nokia, companies I advised over the years, and they would come to us and say, where should we go? Like, here's the chess, assess the chessboard for us. What move should we make? Should we acquire this company? Should we sell this division? So we had to analyze the entire company, look at their assets, decide what to sell, what to keep, and then what should they acquire? To me, that was real value add because you're determining the arc of that company. You know, Northrop wouldn't exist today if they hadn't done a hostel of Grumman, mm -hmm. right? IBM, although it's gone through rough times, but during its 
its rebirth, you know, they wouldn't have done that if they weren't making the acquisitions they were every year. So to me, those were those are the ultimate strategic questions. And here we are sitting in the room with the CEO telling them what chess moves they should make. Were there ever a CEO who pushed back in a way that made you rethink the strategy that you had tried to get them to buy into? Quite often there were there, it was it was a lot of push back and forth. The back and forth, like, no, I don't want to do this. I don't, I do want to do this. What was interesting, once they did one and it was successful, they always wanted to do another. And if they did one and it didn't work, it was like, oh, I got, I went in the water, the shark bit me, I'm not going back. So a lot of the debate was like, not almost like what to do often. It was like, should I? And getting them to have the confidence to actually make the move. What about the structure of some of these companies uh, moving from partnerships to publicly traded? Yeah, that had a huge impact. It, at, at its essence, it's, it separated accountability from risk. So when you were a partnership, it was your money, your partner's money. And so every decision you made was going to make or lose your money. And then for reasons that, and this is one of the themes of the book, you know, as I say, every bad idea, as if you heard every bad idea started as a good idea, right? The partnerships weren't big enough. They couldn't meet the modern demands of a globalizing world. So they went public. Once they went public, it was now other people's money. It wasn't the partner's money. It was the shareholder's money. And you could then also, through various techniques, you could expand the balance sheet dramatically. This is when Solomon Brothers and Goldman, their, their balance sheet went into the trillions of dollars. I remember the first time I saw that Solomon Brothers' balance sheet was a trillion dollars. I was like, that, money, that number was like breathtaking to me. And here now you have that money that you can now go make, I don't want to say bets, let's say investments. Right. But, but. When it's other people's money, the line starts to blur between whether it's an investment or a bet because it's a, as I say in the book, it's a heads I win, tails other people lose business. So you're, you're, you're you're not as constrained by the fact that it's your money. And so you start to see more and more risk being taken on. If you were to wave your magic wand of 2019 and look back, what would have been a way maybe from a regulatory standpoint, Mm -hmm. that we could have contained some of the excesses of those animal spirits. Yeah, it all comes back to incentives, of course. And the one incentive that is, is lingers from days of old that we haven't been able to break is this, this belief that we're tied to the annual compensation cycle. The fact that the, the time that it takes the earth to go around the sun should determine the compensation cycle, it, it really doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. You went to Silicon Valley when? In 2001, two? Right after the dot-com boom. I moved actually uh, pretty much a week before 9-11, which oh, is how okay. I remember when I did make that so move. So you, you left it, lived, that, Left New York. And then what was it, what were you doing in Silicon Valley? Same thing? I was uh, running the technology uh, department for uh, Citigroup. It was Solomon Brothers, then, became Solomon with Barney. Ten different name changes became Citigroup. Okay, and the, how long were you doing that for? I did that till two thousand, right before the financial crisis. You are very good with your milestones. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's, and I can't say I saw them coming, of course. Okay, um, and then I started a private equity firm. Talk about the difference between the post dot com era, so those two thousands. Mm-hmm. While there is this crazy thing happening in the rest of the universe, right? right, right. And which I'm sure you're aware of on some level, but not focused on. What was the difference? And I'm really wanting to get to the book here. Like, how does money become dangerous? More dangerous in that period of time, even from the eighties to the nineties, and then to the two thousands. You know, so many ways, but I think the. The biggest one is what I call the loss of culture within the banking industry. And what does that mean? So when, and you know this, back in the day when you said Solomon Brothers, there's an image that came to mind. When you said Goldman, there was an image that came to mind. When you said Morgan Stanley, like everyone had a unique, specific culture. And we all know culture eats strategy for breakfast. We've all heard that. But the best firms had the unique cultures. Mm -hmm. I would even say that's true today, but there's much fewer But now when you say institutions, you know, they're all almost the same because when they became large, it became about scale, scope, and efficiency. It wasn't about the people. 
it was all about the platform. And like, if we get the best platform, the people in it don't matter as much. And all the CEOs will push back on that. No, no. The only thing that makes us uh, our people, it's everything. Our people are the people, the people, they all talk about that. All about the people. And what does that mean? Where are you actually doing something that reinforces that? Right. What is it that you're doing to to demonstrate that it's about the people? Like, what what is the mission statement of these large organizations? And how yeah. can you have one? Because they are so big. Exactly. So the dot com boom and bust was sort of an easy one, easy, right? Right. Like, hope, uh, hope got out in front of reality, as it does. Hope and hope and reality never go in tandem. It's either right. it's either more hope than reality or less hope. And sometimes it gets out in front, and it you know that exuberance needs to be reset. And right. luckily, it was. I, you know, if you own the equities, it was par- painful, but there wasn't really a leverage component, which right, is what so, gets you in trouble. Right. Yeah. So no borrowed money. Just like we threw a lot of money into Pets.com. Com, we right. thought that was going to be the big thing. And right. there's a slight recession, not a horrible one. Right, right, right. And the vast majority of Americans are OK. Mm-hmm. OK, so now you're out in Silicon Valley. You're doing your deals. You're psyched because like out of the ashes, right. you get to build up these beautiful new companies. Build relationships while everybody's running. All, I said all the U-Hauls were going east. I moved, you know, west. While everyone's running, that's when you that's when you build relationships. You don't build relationships when times are good. You build relationships when times are bad. So I said now, you know, back then it was like in the dot com, unless you were Morgan Stanley Goldman or wherever Frank Quattron was, nobody wanted to meet with you, right? right. And, but now it was like, okay, we'll meet with City. You, you can offer all these services. Like all of a sudden, like serv- like these things matter. Like, oh, you can manage my cat, you know? So that was, yeah, that was the time to build a relationship. So at that time, and you're also in California where there is a little bit of ground zero for the housing stuff that's going Absolutely. on. What did you notice at that time? Just were you so focused on you know, what you were doing and building these relationships and, and rebuilding from scratch is kind of easier. Or did you did you see out of this, your rear view mirror, like, hmm, what's going on over there? That seems kind of weird. Well, the first thing that happens is, you know, my wife is like, well, we need to buy a house. And I'm like, no way. The housing prices are crazy here. They have to correct. I kept telling her they have to correct. Like, this is not sustainable. This is not sustainable. You know, but little did I know we were in the central bank, we're going to keep interest rates low combined with all other factors that we rented for five years until I finally just threw in the towel and said, you know, I'm going to close my eyes and, you know, we're going to buy. I'm so rich. I don't care. Yeah, well, (laughs) you cared a little bit. (laughs) You always (laughs) buying a house in California. I don't care how rich you are. it's, It's not. It's not. But I thought, okay, this massive and then, you know, we cover Stockton, you know, just 70 miles away. You have like all of these people putting massive amounts of money into houses and and building and the like and and then when you see how they're doing it and having seen the the rodeo before of like okay being seduced by the opportunity for building a huge market and having to all you need to do is sort of lower the standards and a little, look, bit. little bit and look the other way and then you know you start boiling the frog and next thing you know you're doing things that when the blow up happens and the dust settles, I, I always say after the fact, every disaster is easy to explain. As I say, if you think an iceberg sank the Titanic, okay, yeah, that's, that's the right answer. But does that really tell you anything? Like right. there were so many bad decisions and circumstances that had to go into the Titanic hitting that iceberg at that moment mm-hmm. that you know you you really have learned nothing if your historical def- if your historical accounting of the Titanic is a hidden iceberg have we learned the lessons of the financial crisis in your mind i mean like that has got to be the epitome of how money became dangerous right what lessons have we learned and what lessons have institutions learned you're on the other side of these guys you don't have to protect them anymore have they learned their lessons? Well, I think they learned the specific lesson of, okay, that animal bit me, so stay away from that animal. But it seems like every crisis gives us a new creature, some three-letter acronym that we know. Who knew of collateralized mortgage obligations before the financial crisis? So did they learn a specific lesson? Yes. Although you see more and more, you're starting to see the, even the mortgage rules and, and regu- you're seeing those to be more and more less. So I, I even wonder. And then banks have really gotten their balance sheets. They're much stronger than they were. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they're still now 15 trillion now in in the shadow banking industry that's completely unregulated and off off to the side. And so, yeah, they've learned a specific lesson, but is there anyone who has a holistic view of the system 
or could possibly understand the system. So I agree with you. No one person can really manage these huge banks. Mm -hmm. But who is the one person or who are the entities that are really looking at the systemic risk and looking at all the forces covered in in the book and how they're coming together to create a potentially dangerous situation. But I mean, ostensibly, that would be the Federal Reserve. When you have these big, huge organizations, and as you say, they're sort of guided by quarter to quarter, annual, and the do the right thing mantra has sort of been thrown out the window because it's like make as much money as you possibly can. I don't see how the system doesn't get tripped up every bunch of years and we all pay the price for it. This is where I think Singapore has it right, which is like, let's have the regulators be the smartest and the highest paid people because systemic risk is probably the hardest thing to analyze. And so I don't want to take away from many of the smart people that work in the regulatory environment, but they, you know, you're not getting the people necessarily with the right background, the right experience, and frankly, the incentive and the means to think about systemic risk. This is Jill on Money. Hey, gang, it's me, Jill Schlesinger. You know that. You're listening to the pod. Certified financial planner, CBS News business analyst, host of this here podcast, Jill on Money. And I am here to tell you about our sponsor, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. They're helping people achieve financial well-being with simple and transparent banking products, including Clarity Money. That's a free personal finance management app that's part of the Marcus family. Clarity Money is your AI-powered financial champion that shows you a simple view of your finances together in one place. They recently launched a weekly budgeting feature that you've just got to try. The app does the hard part for you and calculates your average weekly spend by category. You can take that information so you can set informed budget goals based on what matters most to you. You can also subscribe to budget alerts to help keep you on track and start with a clean slate every week. Who doesn't want that? It's super easy to use and can make a task like budgeting kind of fun. So go check it out. Download Clarity Money through Google Play or iTunes or visit Marcus.com forward slash Clarity. And now back to our interview with Chris Varellis. How can money become less dangerous? First of all, very convoluted problem that can't, there's no silver bullet. So it's going to be a multi-pronged approach. And right, it's you're gonna, not running for office. I'm just yeah, saying. No, yeah, yeah, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take changes at the government level, the banking level, and you as an individual have to you know, have to do some things. Okay, as well. wait a minute. Let's start big to small. So, okay. government level, what do you think needs to happen? Many things. I'll pick one. We have to address the obvious bubble in the room, which is the pension crisis, right? We all know there's a huge pension crisis. We're all complicit in it. We know that these pensions are massively underfunded. You know, 60% in the case of California, 20% in the case of Chicago Fire. Puerto Rico non uniform pension was 1% funded at the time of, of the bankruptcy. Yet no one has the political will or desire to address this. So we're continuing to not invest in these pensions. And worse, while we kick the can, the can's getting bigger because we're like, oh, you're going to give me that. And I want to make this. No one wants to talk about pension math. But if you're going to give me these aggressive underwriting assumptions, I'm going to give out more pensions because I have cash constraints. My government employees are raising their hands saying I want more. Well, you know what? I'll give them a pension or a higher pension of benefits, which, you know, that bill will come due long after I'm out of office. So the first thing we can do at the federal level is let's start doing what we do in the private sector with ERISA. We actually have standards. We have a board that says, you know, let me look at your underwriting assumptions. Let me look at, you know, your how you're funding it and start to get this uniform um, check of the pension system itself. The fact that that doesn't exist shows you that the politics don't allow us to make the really tough decisions and to really hold these public officials accountable. That's a big picture, a pension. Uh, so one pension piece. You want to give me a nod about regulation? What, what about on the regulatory front? So I, I little anecdote, dinner party, we were talking about regulation. Sounds like a really fun dinner party. I know. Yes, awesome. Really. Doing great. shots. Yeah, I yeah, know. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, fun, fun, fun. It's like what, it's what, you know, when bankers get together, finance people, we love talking about these things. So I'd read a fact that at City there were 240,000 employees and 30,000 of them were in compliance. Mm-hmm. And the person to my left of one leaning said, I can't believe it's one in eight. 
the person to my right said, I can't believe it's one in eight. And the person on the left was like, how can one person possibly watch eight people? <laughs> right? Like we need more. Right? Mm -hmm. And the person on my right was like, wait a second, you have 30,000? Like, it shocks me that one out of eight people are working in compliance, right? And, and so it comes down to what are they doing? What is their focus? Do we get lost behind the notion that if we're looking at the little things, the big things will take care of themselves? That's not the way it works in finance. Yeah. You know, in our lives, that might be true. It's the atomic habit. The little things, you know, add up to big Mm -mm. That's not the curse in finance. No. Like, and by the way, disclosure statements, which no one ever reads, we've, we've gone in the wrong direction, right? And so the one thing we can do in compliance is we have to take a step back and say, let's make sure we're circumscribing risk and not focused on the individual act of one person. While that can be obviously very problematic. Are you a debt deficit kind of guy? Let me start with that. Yes. The answer is at some point, yes. Like you have so much capacity and history has shown there's a breaking point. You know, I, you know you've seen the studies that say once you get to 130% of your GDP, a- you know, 160 and, and the like, who knows what the number is. But we seem very cavalier with big numbers. Yeah. We, we I have a, the rule of 80,000, which is no one understands a number over 80,000 because it's the bigger, biggest number they've ever seen and they know they're looking at it, which is basically people in a football stadium, mm-hmm. right? And so we, we calculate, we throw around trillions now like they're nothing. And that cavalier notion of an extra trillion and a half every year of a deficit, like at some point when you add that to the pension, to the student debt, when you put it all together... Something the same happened. system, the same group, it's the same group of people. Let's just take the United States. It's the same 300 million people right. working in this economy, creating value and productivity that are someday going to have to pay that debt. I've become very intrigued by this modern monetary yes. theory. MMT, yes. MMT. Okay. So the theory being that you can, if you have a fiat currency like the U.S. dollar, right, mm-hmm. that you can actually carry a much right. greater amount of debt until it creates inflation. Correct. And then at the point that it creates inflation, then you've got to change your tack. You know, I guess that there's a point to that, except I always feel like once you created inflation, it's too late. It's too late. Well, if you really want to give credence to the theorists, they believe you can control inflation because as long as you have full employment and manage that, you won't. So just to give credit to the right. theory, I have two issues with it. It's never been proven. And two, if you're wrong. That's right. If the you're stakes wrong, are so high. Like, would you really engage on any activity that said, okay, you can live how you want. It's almost like saying you can eat what you want. You can do what you want. You can be whatever you want to be with like one limitation, give them credit for that, as long as there's full employment. But at the end, it'll be fine. But the question is, if you're wrong, it's a disaster scenario. Right. And, and and so to me, I actually think the fact that that's the case makes it very hard to argue. And by the way, I think the people arguing for it, they've almost said, okay, I want to do this. Let me go find a theory that backs me. I'm always suspect when the causality is first political objective, and then let me find the economic mm-hmm. theory. And then this is not a left or right thing. This yeah, is yeah, this, yeah. this happens through the whole spectrum, sure. right? It's, 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 you know, let me shop for the economic theory that's going to get me what, you know, it's going to legitimize what I want to do. Okay. So big picture, pensions, debt deficit, some federal regulation that's uh, more maybe big picture principles and rules based. So go to the next level in terms of finance. What is it that has to get done down at the next level, whether that's, I guess, the actual institutions themselves or venture or private equity, what has to happen among them to make things a little less dangerous? Yeah, the industry, I think, needs to do two big things. One, we've talked about incentives. You just need to to change the incentive structure. Really hard to break. Understand that. The other is you need a mission, right? You need to actually come up with why do you add value? I always say it's like the financial system is like your blood supply. You don't want to think about it, but you can't survive without it. Think about how much finance, this is why your show is so important. Think about how much finance touches you every day. Like just go through a day and count how much, how many times money touches you. It's, it's, it's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. But it's your blood supply. You don't want to think about it. You only think about it when it's infected. 
right? There's something in it. I got to get it out, Mm -hmm. right? You start to look at the whole financial system as like a bad thing when it's doing so much for you. And whose fault is that? The, The financial industry has to step back and say, what's our case? I always say the good society, a functioning society can't exist without a functioning financial industry. But we're terrible. We're making no effort to convince the world that we actually have value. And I think once you do that, your cultures will you know, change. People will be more excited about working in the industry. People are embarrassed now. You know, like, like you'd rather say 10 other things than go to a dinner party and say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm an investment banker. I work on Wall Street, right? I mean, <laughs> like that's, that's not... It used to be a badge of honor. It used to be. It used to be with pride, right? Right, absolutely. Right? All right, now you said individuals. So many things we can do as individuals. One is hold politicians accountable. We ask about sustainability in everything we do, food, energy, housing. We never ask about the sustainability of the financial industry. Mm. What are you doing about the pension crisis in my state? What are you going to do to ensure that these benefits that we've been promised actually materialize? So, so holding politicians accountable. Two, not being such a passive owner. We've, we've gotten so comfortable with being passive owners of everything. Like, I don't actually want to know what I own or what these companies do or how they're being managed for all this talk of, you know, having to keep managements accountable, right? How do we keep executives like we, what are we doing to do that? Mm -hmm. We're happy to say, oh, you're going to give me the cheapest way to own these stocks and I asset allocate properly where we've come away from the micro challenges. So we don't know what companies do or follow it. And if we as individuals, I know we don't have the time and a lot of us don't have the knowledge. So this is a personal investment. But I believe if you learn more about money, if you know how money moves, you can understand how the world works. Here's what I think. Because I deal with individuals so often, we take calls on this, and I feel like there's a lot of people who are trying their best to put Mm -hmm. their arms around it. There's a lot we're asking people to do right now in their lives, and a lot of people are kind of drowning. I agree that we should be more accountable, and I wish that, but I also know that in a country where half of the population does not own a stock, a bond, a mutual fund, or have a pension, Mm -hmm. that the things that we need to help them with are are different than the the investment side. It's really about like, how can we help you understand that this is something that we can help you put on autopilot, but it does take some work on the front end. You got to do something. You got to step on the scale with me. You got to at least understand like the difference between this and this, you know? So I'm also intrigued by where you see some some good stuff happening. Where I see hope is is the innovation level at the sort of entrepreneurial state because all the all the real innovation is not happening at the big banks. It's happening at the fintech. Look at the technology where we're getting access to credit and all these poor countries and poor places where it's changing lives, right? Even even a few dollars being able to access it through your phone mm-hmm. is is quite, you know, quite amazing. And so the hope the hope is is really there that the innovation and access and knowledge and exposure to money and finance and the what it can bring you is being spread to more and more people. I think those are the most upbeat stories when you hear about these, you know, these people, you know, getting loans in Africa for you know, twenty, thirty dollars, and it's it's, it's and it works. It, it works, right? And the you know they, they understand. This is where risk models are a great thing because they say, okay, we know we can loan to you know this many, usually women. Interestingly, in many cases, this many women, and we know that the payback is going to justify the, the the amount. And you know, we may look at the rates and say, well, those are big, but they're well within anything they could ever hope to get without the technology and the innovation that we're seeing. And that is the lubricant to the economy and to the personal wealth of those people. Right. All right. Before you go, started, I said, best career or money decision you ever made. What's the worst? Ooh, the worst. There's so many. Uh, Oh, like a good trader. See, there's your foundation. (laughs) Yeah, no. There's so there's so many. The worst trade I've ever made. You know, I'm one of those people that I can't remember which famous philosopher said the most important human evol- evolution is the ability to forget, mm. right? Because we 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 move on. Guys, it's, it's hard. Maybe to, not buying that house when your wife said to buy it. That was a really bad decision. 
that was that was a bad decision. Um, yeah, no. If I'd bought that house, um, I clearly would have made quite a bit of money on it. And but know. no bad career decision. You don't regret zigs and zags in your career, right? No. What what I what I wonder now is, and this is true for I think so many people. When you look back at your successes, I always say, how much of that success was based on the fact that you didn't fully appreciate the risk, mm. right? And I always say, like, if I if I put myself back now in the same situation where the things I'm most proud of, I probably wouldn't have tried the strategy because experience would have told me the likelihood that that's a good move is so low. And so I ask myself now, what what am I not doing? Mm. So to me, the worst decision is what you don't do based on fear or assessment of risk. And you don't know those, Mm -hmm. right? So to me, if I make a bad decision, it doesn't work. I look back and I say, okay, based on the information I had, was it still the right move? That doesn't, that doesn't make it. And so I actually think for many of us, the worst decisions we've ever made are the risks we didn't take and we don't know what we've lost as a result. You're listening to Jill on Money. Okay, it's time for the Marcus Minute. We're presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. In the hot seat today, Christopher Varelis. The name of the book is How Money Became Dangerous. Chris, are you ready to play? I believe so. What's one word to describe your relationship with money? Um, nervous. What's always worth spending on? Love. What's the dumbest thing you've spent money on? Ooh, cars. How much do you spend on a haircut? About 40 bucks, which is 35 more than I should. It's your last day on earth. You've got $100 in your pocket. What's your last meal? My last meal? Oh, that's a tough one. It, it's probably the uh, chocolate uh, souffle at Cafe Jacqueline. Mm. Chris Varellis, thank you for playing. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thanks to Chris Varellis. And hey, sorry about co-author Dan Stone. We didn't have enough room in the studio. But check out their book, How Money Became Dangerous. We drop new episodes of Jill on Money every Tuesday and Thursday. We like to maybe sneak in a Friday bonus episode every now and again. So if you don't want to miss any of this, subscribe to the podcast. You can do that on Apple, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else that you find the stuff you like listening to. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer, and he also recently passed the CFP test. I'm so proud of him. We're distributed by Cadence 13. The show is presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. See you next week. 